Hi, I'm Gary Dumbrow, and today I'm going to be talking about why social workers need to think outside the box. Boxes, at least the ones that influence us the most, tend to be designed by people with power who have a vested interest in you thinking the way they want you to think and a vested interest in you not thinking in ways that would threaten their power. Boxes are not always bad. Sometimes they give you a framework that helps you figure things out that you would never have been able to figure out without them. But boxes are not always good either. So you've got to know when you're in a box and also the ways that box either constrains or enables your thinking. So in this episode, what are boxes? How do you recognize them? How do you figure out what they're asking you to buy into, and what has any of this got to do with social work. In this episode, I'm going to be drawing on some of the content of the book Anti-Oppressive Social Work Ways of Knowing, Talking and Doing that I co-authored with Dr. Jun Ying Yi from Ryerson University. And in this episode, I'm also going to be joined for part of it by Dr. Winnie Lowe, who played a consulting role when we wrote that book. The content of the episode won't be exactly like the book, you're going to get some of the behind the scene glimpses of ideas and events that shaped the way the book was written. So enough with the introduction, let's get into it. So I want to start you off with a story. A few years back, I was walking in Hong Kong and I noticed that the name of the street I was on was Devon Road. There was a big sign and it said Devon Road. Now that sign seemed suspicious to me, kind of out of place, because Devon is a county in England. The sign brought back childhood memories of me sitting on a beach in Devon, looking out to sea with my dad and listening to his stories. My dad had been a sailor, so those stories were mostly about places on the other side of the world, and some of those stories included Hong Kong. So now fast forward, and here I am all grown up in Hong Kong and looking at a sign called Devon Road. But how did this unfamiliar place get this familiar name? There was something going on here that this sign wasn't telling me. I already knew that Hong Kong was colonized by the British a long time ago. So I expect that white British overlords lived in this neighborhood and named the streets for places back home. But the flashback to memories of my childhood in England made me think that there was more to this sign than meets the eye. Sure, the sign looked harmless enough hanging out on the street corner, but that innocent look wasn't fooling me. I had a suspicion that this sign was a gangster guarding turf, a salesperson peddling an idea. The sign was an invite to buy into something, and I'm not sure what it was, but I was pretty sure that if I bought into it, I'd never be able to think for myself again. I can imagine you're thinking I'm being overdramatic, but I learned not to trust street signs in Canada which I should actually be calling Turtle Island, because the names of streets and even towns and cities in Canada are playing a game of cover-up. They're stopping us asking, whose territory is this? What was the original name of this place? Where are the traditional histories and stories of this place? Hong Kong may be on the exact opposite side of the world, but it's the exact same colonizer and the exact same tricks. The sign might say Devon Road, but I know it isn't telling the truth. I've been to Devon with my dad, and he always taught me to be suspicious of anyone or anything hanging out on a street corner trying to sell you something. So what was or is the original name of this place? On the sign under the word Devon Road, there are three Chinese characters. Maybe these are a clue to the original name. So I called a friend and asked what the characters mean. Let me take you back to that moment. Wei. Hey, it's your Guai Lo Peng Yao. <laughs> Hi. Your Chinese is getting better. Yeah, you're humoring me again. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's up? Yeah, I'm in Kowloon Tong on Devon Road. Devon Road, I know Devon Road. My old school wasn't far away from there. I think I remember you telling me that, yeah. So I was wondering, 
Do you know like what the original name of this place was before someone called it Devon Road? Mm, no, I only know it as Devon Road. There are three Chinese characters under the English word Devon Road. Do you remember them? Do you, do you know what they mean? Yeah, I remember them. I'm not sure if they have a cohesive meaning, but I can tell you what each word means. Like I mentioned to you before, when reading Chinese, each character is actually an entire word and not an alphabet like in English. So in this case, the first character uh, of the three characters is pronounced as tak, meaning morals or morality, kind of like virtue. And then the next character is pronounced as wan, meaning cloud, like a cloud in the sky. And the last character pronounced as do, meaning road, as in a path or a trail. So the three characters together in English literally are morals, cloud, road. Morals, cloud, road, dok wan do. Does that really mean anything? Um, no, it really doesn't have a cohesive meaning. But when you pronounce these three characters together, that one though, that sounds a bit like Devon Road, doesn't it? Like to your ears? Yeah, yeah. Like that one though, Devon Road. So the British threaded Chinese characters together that makes a sentence that means nothing in Chinese, but when sounded out, in Cantonese, it makes the sound of an English word that means something to the English people. Yeah, I think the Chinese name was created to fit the pronunciation of the English name. Huh. So I, I was wondering if then signs like this hang out on street corners to cause people to think about and talk about this place in a certain way. So in this neighborhood, at least, the colonizers used English names to make themselves feel at home while simultaneously disconnecting the colonized from their own land and places. Yeah, you know what that reminds me of? When I went to Oxford University in England to present in a conference a few years back, I was riding on a shuttle from Gatwick Airport to Oxford, and for some strange reason, the landscape reminded me so much about Hong Kong. Um, I mean, how the roads and the physical environment are constructed all has this strange sense of familiarity to them. Um, and how can that make sense? I was asking myself. Yeah, because that was your first time in England. Yeah, that's right. So I was thinking, how could I feel familiar with a strange place? And then, you know what I think? No, what do you think? Yeah, I think it is because the English created Hong Kong in the image of their motherland, mostly for their benefits. So in other words, I was living in the box they created for me, and they wanted me to see the world through that box. I have always thought that my formative years under the UK education system in Hong Kong has had a lasting effect on colonizing my mind. But only until that trip to Oxford did I begin to realize how powerful that box was. That's really interesting. So maybe what we can say is that Devon Road, the sign is really up to no good. Like the British have gone home, but here is that sign still hanging out on the corner working on their behalf. Yeah, I think you're right. And these colonization tactics are not limited to the ways we encounter physical space. They also occur in the ways people are invited to see or not to see their place in history and in the creation of arts, ideas, and scientific knowledge. I think you talked about that too in relation to where the idea of critical thinking came from. Yeah, yeah. If you Google critical thinking, at least when I did it, the internet tells you it's dead white guys who invented it. And last time I looked, it was Dewey and Socrates who were supposed to have in invented critical thinking. And But you know this because we've talked about it before. You've told me how Confucius was teaching students in China to think critically way before Dewey or Socrates was even born. Yeah, you're right. Confucius was saying, Which means learning without thinking is a vain effort. Thinking without learning is a dangerous effort. That's right, exactly. And I think there is a connection between the internet telling us that white European invented critical thinking and the street in Hong Kong being called Devon Road. Hmm. 
Okay, so tell me more. What what do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean they both invite people into the same box. They both disconnect or try to disconnect non-Europeans from their histories, places, and lands, and to center white European histories and ideas as the center of everything important. Is that making any sense to you? Yeah. So they both are an occupation of physical and conceptual territories. They both provide a map that now precedes these territories. So, so like the British came up with a way of calling this place a certain thing, and that's a way of thinking about it. They've gone, but that box that they want you to think within is still there. Yeah. True. One more thing, though, we both use the word box here. But when I teach, I use the words power and knowledge. What I said to the student is, what becomes recognized as legitimate knowledge has little to do about truth, quote and quotes, but a lot to do about power. What controls knowledge also controls the mind. Just like colonial power can make a worldview become the worldview. Yeah, and another word for worldview, aside from box, that's connected to power and knowledge, is the word paradigm because it brings together both of those ideas. Yeah, for sure. Well, anyway, I hope I have helped. You certainly did. <laughs> well, anything else before I let you go? No, I don't think so. Okay, so enjoy Devon Road. Hey, stop putting milk in your tea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye. Bye. So a big thanks to Dr. Winnie Lowe for that WeChat conversation. Back to that word paradigm. A paradigm is a bit like a worldview. It's a conceptual framework through which we figure things out. I like to call paradigms boxes because they contain your thinking. And like I said at the start of the episode, this can either enable you to understand things that you never dreamed of before, but also can limit your dreams, imagination and understanding. So when you're thinking, you need to not be just thinking, you need to be thinking about how you're thinking. An example of a paradigm is the map of the universe. Long ago, people believed that the Earth was the center of the universe. The sun, the moon, the planets all rotated around the Earth. When astronomers looked up at the night sky and tried to figure out the trajectories and the math for what was going on and why, this map framed their thinking and their conclusions. Copernicus then comes along and breaks open this box by figuring out that the Earth and planets actually move around the sun. Imagine the night after this discovery. You look up and everything in the sky looks the same as it did the night before. But everything now has new meaning. Suddenly the math makes more sense. The trajectory is understood. And all the things that didn't add up before now add up perfectly. Copernicus shifted the paradigm. And so important was Copernicus's contribution to the way we think that any major shift in our thinking is now called a Copernican revolution. Now, if you read the book, the Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn, and you should read it despite what I'm about to say now, Copernicus is used in that book as an example of not only causing a paradigm shift, but of literally changing the way we look at the world. So here's the thing. Copernicus didn't really change the way we look at the world. I mean, he did for Europeans, but people elsewhere in the world had figured out that the Earth moved around the Sun long before Copernicus was even born. I can name two astronomers who long before Copernicus discovered the Earth revolved around the Sun. One from the Golden Age of Islam, in what is now called Iran, and another from Bharat or India. So do you know their names? If so, great. But if not, and particularly if you know the name of Copernicus, you may have fallen victim to the fact that Copernicus' paradigm shift that told us the Earth wasn't the center of the universe took place within another paradigm that tells us that Europe is the center of the Earth. But the question is, so what does any of this have to do with social work? The answer is that all social work happens in a paradigm, or you could argue paradigms. But when I use the plural, it does take some liberties with some of the original concepts of the word paradigm. You 
can't work without paradigms. They enable you to make sense of things and to figure things out. But remember that paradigms not only enable your thinking, they also constrain your thinking too. Because every way of thinking is also a way of not thinking. So another way of understanding how this plays out for social work is that we each have a set of assumptions about the existence and the nature of the world. And we would call that ontology. And these shape the way we try and understand the world. And that understanding process is something we call epistemology. And that epistemology informs the way we make sense of and explain the world. And that's theory. And our theory dictates the way we act and react in the world. And for us as social workers, that's our practice. So we can break all this down with the foundation of what we're doing being the ontology on which we build our epistemologies, from which we develop theory, from which we develop our practice and the way we work with families and communities. All of these elements form a paradigm, a box that we are operating within. Or if I take some liberties with the concept, boxes that we operate within. As a social worker, you need to be aware of these deeper levels of thinking at the ontological, epistemological and theory level. Now, some people say, I just want to go out and help people. So teach me practice. I don't come here to learn all this theory and philosophical stuff. Well, the problem with that is you may not be helping people at all. There's a whole universe of theories, epistemologies and ontology that shapes the helping you do. And if you're not aware of these levels and what's going on at this level, you're boxed in and implementing somebody else's ideas, politics and belief systems without even being aware of it. And it's quite possible that many of these belief systems and theories and ways of understanding the world are actually producing the cause of your client's troubles and as such cannot provide a paradigm within which remedies can be even imagined, let alone achieved. Find yourself in that box and you drag service users and communities in with you. Because from that place of practice, you will name and label the troubles and problems of service users in a way that may have no relevance to the realities service users exist within and no connection to their histories. And if you think about it, that's exactly what the sign on the corner of Devon Road is doing. And this is why it's really important for social workers to be able to think outside the box. Of course, before you can think outside the box, you've got to figure out what box you're in. And we're all in a box one way or another. And when we're thinking about what box we're in, we've also got to figure out, well, whose interests is that box serving? Is this the best place to be positioning my practice from? And if you don't engage in that level of critical thinking, you might be in danger of winding up just like that sign on the corner of Devon Road in Hong Kong. So I'm going to leave you with that to think about. And that's it from me. If you find this episode interesting or useful or thought provoking, give it a thumbs up. Leave some comments if you like. Also consider subscribing so that when new episodes come out, you'll be the first to know. And I will see you next time.